Welcome to all those here in our church sanctuary. So good morning to each of you and those listening on the radio as well as those watching on the internet. We are certainly delighted to bring you lesson 10 in this series on hope for the future. It is titled Created for Glory. And we're in a new series here that we think will bring hope to many of you in this time of great need of hope, for sure. So let us pray before we get into God's Word. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to share your Word. I ask you to use me as a vessel so that the words you want your people to hear come through me. Lord, we're just grateful for this beautiful Sabbath day, for the opportunity to continue to come together and worship. And Lord, we thank you for each and every person here. We ask you to be with each and every person and their families. In your name we pray. Amen. So, I don't know if you can see the screen really well in here, but suppose you're on vacation And you decide to spend time looking through some of the nearby gift shops. I'm guilty. I don't know if anybody else is, but on vacation you tend to go take a little time just to see what's around that you haven't seen maybe. Some of them, these gift shops, are filled with lots of cheap trinkets, and I've seen those as well, but some are stockpiled with wonderful creations from the local artisans in the area. You'll see sculptures and paintings, bronze, glass, and stone art. You marvel at the intricacy and the creativity of some of these pieces, as well as the price tags that go along with them. And as you browse through, you find a piece that you especially admire, and you ask the shop owner, what's the name of the artist that created this? And they say, oh, nobody made that. They say, nobody made anything in here. We had an explosion in the building a while back, and when we came in afterward, we just found all these beautiful things that you see here. And instantly, you suspect that that owner is insane because you know when you see a beautiful creation, somebody had to create it. It couldn't just appear out of an explosion. The whole world was excited to see the amazing feat of the first space shuttle flight. We saw the rocket ignite, and then that supporting mechanism fell away from the rocket, and the mighty power of that engine lifted the vehicle heavenward. We listened with keen anticipation to regular reports on the capsule's progress as it separated from the shuttle and continued on its way through space. Radio messages from the astronauts and their detailed descriptions reminded us of the years and years of research and planning and development that had been necessary to build and launch the Columbia. Thrusting it into space and safely returning it back to Earth. If anyone watching the Columbia launch during her flight in the air, declared that the whole project was just a result of blind chance, they would have been labeled insane. You would have known there was lots of planning and execution. At the turn of the century, Napoleon and his army were on their way across the Mediterranean Sea to conquer the Egyptians. One starlit night, a number of Napoleon's soldiers, products of the French Revolution and its rejection of God, were trying to outdo each other in giving reasons why they know there is no God. Napoleon, in his charismatic manner, was pacing back and forth on the deck, listening to their reasoning when one of them asked him what he thought of what they said. He thoughtfully responded, Very good. 
But if there is not God, then who made and sustains all of those? And he pointed upward toward the stars in the sky, looking down on them. That is a good question. Who made this world and the billions and billions of stars and who charts their course and who keeps them in that course? Many gods have been worshipped by people throughout history, and we know that. And many people worship different gods still today. Buddha, Shinto, Satan, the gods of the Hindus, and many, many others. Their followers each claim that their god is the only one true and supreme god in the world. And many of them have been taught that God is not the creator of all that we see. They believe instead what Darwin taught. It's called a theory of evolution. It teaches our children that the world came into being through a series of changes that took place over billions of years. The theory of evolution teaches that once the first cell was formed, then through many biological and geological changes, this marvelous universe just came into being. Blind chance and miraculous changes, he says, accounts for everything that we see around us. Is it really possible that the world and all that's in it, including us, have evolved over billions of years? Or is there a supreme being who created and sustains life on this earth? Revelation 14.7 calls us to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. The very basis of our Christian beliefs is the fact that God is our creator and sustainer of life. So our subject today is created for glory. So as we begin, I want to remind you that we do a question and answer format. And these are commonly asked questions that people might have, and we try to answer those for you. There is more in-depth Bible study available on any of these topics if anyone is interested in learning more, because we'll do a cursory overview of this. So the first question, how did the earth come into existence? Let's start at the beginning of our Bible in Genesis. The word Genesis in Hebrew means beginning. And so it's appropriate that we start there in the book of beginnings. Here we find the beginning of the universe, then the beginning of life forms, then the beginning of man and woman, as well as the beginning of sin and death. This is also where we see the beginning of God's redemptive plan by the beginning of a nation. But who created it all from the beginning? Well, let's go to Genesis 1, verse 1. And it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What part did the Holy Spirit have in creation? Well, as we know, and as we continue through Genesis, we see in Genesis 1, verse 2, that it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God, we know as the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the waters. So the Holy Spirit was there at creation. We know the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. So it would make sense that the Holy Spirit would be there at the beginning of creation. How did God actually create the earth? 
Many of us know the Bible well, know that God spoke it into existence, and we read in Genesis that God said, and it was done. We also read in Psalms 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made their starry host by the breadth of his mouth. And in Psalms 33, 9, it says, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. So, through whom was the earth created? In Hebrews 1, 2, the Bible also tells us, but in the last days he spoke to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So God's Son, Jesus Christ, was also there at creation. He also had a part in creating the universe. Once again, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all there at creation at the beginning. We also read in John 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things have been made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So Paul wrote this book to convince people that Jesus was the Christ and the Son of God. He was the Word. So as we start to go through this creation story, we understand from the very beginning of the Bible, and we'll see to the very end of the Bible, God was the key in creation. Who is the Word of God? We just mentioned. And in John 1.14, it reads, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Word of God, was the creator God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, again, were all there in creation. What did God make on each day of creation? I know many of you in here probably could name those, maybe not in the right order. (laughs) I could name them, but I have to think again about the order that they came in, right? But we're going to go through those fairly quickly, so you'll have a chance to review. Let's go back to Genesis 1 verses 3 through 5. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Notice that a day consisted of evening, then morning. Pretty clear in the Bible and mentioned over and over again at each day of creation. We look at a day and we think of morning and night. But if you read again in the Bible, evening is the beginning of a day. So it's interesting. This is why we also remember today as the Sabbath In the fourth commandment, when it says to worship on the seventh day, it begins sundown on Friday. Many people think the Sabbath is Saturday, which starts Saturday morning. But our worship actually begins on Friday evening at sundown. And it continues to Saturday evening at sundown. That is a day. And I'm so grateful that we have a church that understands God's word and practices it. We begin our Friday at sundown with prayer. We have a group that meets on Friday night, 
and we begin praying because it's the start of our Sabbath. We pray for the church. We pray for people's specific needs. We pray for everything around the world that's going on. And I'm just grateful that we recognize that at the start of our Sabbath, we want to be on our knees. We want to be thanking God, praising God, asking for forgiveness of any of our sins. And then we begin by lifting people up, lifting up the church, lifting up people's uh, families. And believe it or not, each and every one of you who are here, those of you listening online, those of you watching on the internet, we pray for all of you during this Friday evening because we want God to fill you with his word and the truth. And we just are grateful that you're part of this and you get to hear his word. So it's just a wonderful way to start every Sabbath. And it's just a pleasure for us as a group that get on this prayer call that is open to anyone who would like to pray beginning on uh, Friday evening. We put that information in our up-to-date that gets sent out to all the church members, um, the call-in information. And you basically just call in and you get to hear us, each of us praying. If you have a prayer need, you join right in and you pray. And we lift up all those prayers to God as a community. All right, so now we're back to the creation days. We are all aware of physical light. We see it. But the Bible also speaks of spiritual insight as a light. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Before man was created, God provided him with the physical and spiritual light. John says that Jesus was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And that's in John 1, 9. And we read, but you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And we read that in 1 Peter 2, 9. So what did God make on the second day? In Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8, we read, and God said... Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, and the second day. Earth's atmosphere otherwise referred to as a firmament, is divided into five layers, each having a varying composition of gases which affect the temperature greatly. Man lives in the troposphere, which has a composition consisting principally of nitrogen and oxygen. God provided just the right mixture to sustain life. Imagine the perfect conditions that must exist to sustain all life, people, plants, and animals. That composition of air that we are breathing in had to be just so. A changing in the degree of that can mean life and death. So let's look at what God made on the third day. We read in Genesis 1, And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and he gathered the waters together and called them seas. And God said, It was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. 
the land produce vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. You know, it's interesting. I think back when I eat fruit, and I get annoyed that there's seeds in the fruit. I don't know about some of you, but I'm always picking the seeds out of things because I just don't want to accidentally swallow them, and I'm annoyed by them. But you can't be annoyed by them. God created them for a reason. How would we have more fruit and vegetation if we didn't have seed? You see, God's perfect plan is perfect. We have to look at those seeds and say, wow, these were put in there so that we would replicate and reproduce and have a sustaining ability to live on this earth with the fruits and vegetables that are necessary to sustain our bodies. So God knew, and it was perfect, and he was happy, and it was good. What did God make on the fourth day? As we continue in Genesis 1, verses 14 through 19, we then read, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from the night. And let these serve as a sign to mark the seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the sky and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, and the fourth day. God uses the sun to measure each day. The evening and the morning were the fourth day. The moon determines the seasons. He appointed the moon for the seasons. The sun knows it's going down. We see that in Psalm 104, verse 19. What did God make on the fifth day? Genesis 1, verses 20 through 23. And God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth, across the expanse. And God created these great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the waters teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas. Let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. What did God make on the sixth day? Continuing in Genesis 1, verses 24 and 25, And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, Creatures that move along the ground, wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. When God made man... What pattern did he use? Well, we read in Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Did you see those key words in there? Us, let us, and our image. Those are plural. Who is the us and the our We know that God created man. We also know from reading our Bible passages that Jesus was there at creation, and so was the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned earlier. 
So the us would be the Trinity. It would be all three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he is saying, let us make man in our image. What status does man have in God's created beings? We read in Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 8, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man, that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. And then in Genesis 1, 28, we read, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So, what did God do finally on the seventh day? In Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, we read, Thus the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array. But the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on that day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that has been done. Our time of rest refreshes us for our time of service. We are to work six days. We're busy. We're running around, whether it's work at a job or work at home. We're busy working, and we're going and going and going. We need the seventh day to rest, refresh, reflect on God and all the goodness in his creation. God knew that we needed it. Before humans were on the earth, he knew the story of creation, and he knew that people would be busy and distracted and feeling like their priorities are doing the things that are going on every day in their life, and they may not prioritize God of creation. And he said, stop on the seventh day, on the Sabbath. And we know outside the walls of this church and many other people who are worshiping today, people are running around out there. They're busy. They're running errands. They're taking their kids to soccer games, whatever the case may be. The world is busy on the Sabbath. And yet we're told to rest on the Sabbath. God knew that we needed that. So we are here resting, worshiping, focusing on God, his creation. And God told us this is what we are to do. So I'm grateful that we are a church that follows the truth and God's word biblically because God knew we needed it. We are a happier bunch of people because we feel rested and we're doing things the way God asked us to do them and in the order he asked us to do them. He didn't say pick one day, pick any day. Just make sure you rest one day a week. That is not what scripture says. Scripture does not say have at it, pick your favorite day to rest. Scripture says we are to rest on the Sabbath. We know this is the Sabbath, so we are doing as we are told because God will refresh us, he'll bless us, and we'll worship and focus on him. And that is an important piece of information for people who are just learning this. We have an entire study on the Sabbath and the importance of the Sabbath and the blessings that come from following the commandments of God. And the fourth commandment is to worship on the Sabbath. God sanctified it as a gift to man for rest and replenishment, to further our holiness and comfort. So we're grateful for this day. We're grateful that he set up a plan that showed us you work for six days and you rest on the seventh. It was a plan, it was a system, it was set up for us to follow. So after resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it 
or set it apart as a day of rest for man. Following the example of the creator, man was to rest upon the sacred day that he should look upon the heavens and the earth. He might reflect upon God's great work of creation and that as should be, behold the evidences of God's wisdom and goodness. His heart might be filled with love and reverence for his maker. We find that in a book called Patriarchs and Prophets on page 47. Were there any flaws in God's creation? Genesis 1, 31 says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. There were no flaws in creation. It was perfect. It was destined for an eternity and in communion with our creator God. You see, when God created the earth on the seventh day when he rested, creation was perfected. There were no flaws. There was never intended to be death. Nothing would die. And things would live on forever and ever. And we know that sin brought death. And that's why we're in the world that we're in today, because sin created death. And we are so grateful we have a creator that loves us so much that he wasn't going to let that be the end of it. He wasn't going to let the planet just kill itself and die off. He said, I'm coming to save you. I created you. I want you to return to me. I want to bring you back to heaven, to the place that I created from the start before sin entered. But he's only going to bring the people back that want to be there. You have to want to follow Jesus Christ. You have to want to follow his commandments. So God said, I created it perfectly. I'll bring you back to perfection. But you have to want it. You have to. God's not going to force you to be there. So we want that day to come, and that's what we call the second coming, when he comes back to retrieve us, to take us to a heavenly home of perfection. No more death, no more dying, no more hurt, no more pain, and we're looking forward to that day. So God's creation was perfect. How, does, how, does count, how do we count the beginning and the end of each day? We read repeatedly in Genesis, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So we see the morning and the evening and the morning format in creation. And we have to consider that evening starts the day. Now, I know we start our day at 12.01 a.m., which we consider morning, even though it's late into the night for me. Most of us are sleeping, hopefully, at that time. But there is a format that was set up in creation, and again, that's why we consider our worship starting on Friday at sunset and ending Saturday at sunset, and that is the Sabbath day. So what cycle was established at creation? Well, a seven-day week, and it has never changed. He created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, and that still goes on today from the beginning of creation. There were times when they tried to do a 10-day work week, a 10-day week, and that failed. Seven days is the way God set it up, and seven days will be what we have until he comes back to get us. It'll be seven days in heaven. We'll continue to worship on the Sabbath in heaven. So why did God make the earth and all that is in it? Well, we read in Isaiah 45, 18, for this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens... He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Then David says in Psalm 19:1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. God's own creation is revealing his greatness. Then we read in Romans 1, 19 and 20. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, 
because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Wow. No excuses for not knowing and seeing creation. We live in creation. You look out your window in the morning and you see God's creation. It's beautiful. I can't imagine what heaven's going to be like. Sometimes I look over, you know, gardens or I see beautiful flowers. And right now we're seeing lots of things flowering. Many people here in the South are suffering from what's called allergies because of this beautiful pollen that comes out when flowers are, are springing to life. But that's God's creation. You see it, and yet you can't claim to not know it. You can't know that God didn't create these things. He said he created them, and then we get to live in it and see it each and every day. Because he is the creator, what can God claim in the earth? Well, in Psalm 89, verses 11 and 12, it says, The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Those are two mountains that are found. We read about those in the Old Testament, Mount Tabor, where Deborah claimed victory in Judges chapter 4, and Mount Hermon, which was so tall and majestic. And it says that they sing for joy at your name. And in Psalm 50, verse 10 and 11, For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures are the, of the field are mine. God claims it all as the creator. Then in Isaiah 43, 1, we read, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. He claims them as belonging to him, even though they failed spiritually many times, and we do. We're important to God, each one of us, and he summons us by name, and he gives us his name. We are called Christians, and Ellie preached about that when she was preaching the last uh, sermon she preached, and she talked about the name of Christian. That is an honor to carry Christ's name. So we have to be careful what we do as Christians, because the world looks on and ready to point fingers and say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't know that I want to be one of those. When you're sitting in traffic and you're raising your hand at somebody because they didn't take off when the light turned green or somebody's driving too slow and you're swerving to get around them or they're, they're causing you to be late for something, there's lots of things that come into our day as Christians that Satan brings to us just hoping we're going to fail so that somebody will see it and say, oh, that's a Christian. So we have to be careful that God called us by name. He brought us to him. We love him. We want to put on his nature. But we have to stay in contact with God all day throughout the day. We need to be talking to him mentally so that we can stave off what Satan is trying to do, and that is get us to fail get us to be disappointed and sad and depressed and getting us to want to not focus on Christ and the joy that he can bring to us. See, we have a distraction called Satan. We need to be distracted by God. We need to focus on God and let him lead our life and our mind and take over our will so that we're one in communion with God. So what is the basis for our worship of God? Well, let's see what Revelation 4, 11 says. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive the glory and honor 
and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. God is the creator and the sustainer of everything. Well, let's look at some of the scientific evidence in favor of creation. We talked about Earth's atmospheric layers providing protection from the sun's rays. Without that shielding atmosphere, life could not continue on Earth. It is more fundamental to state that without the atmosphere, life could not have developed on Earth, at least in the form in which we know it. It is known, for example, that the sun emits high-energy radiation, ultraviolet and X-rays, and that even more energetic radiation, cosmic rays, pervades space. These radiations kill living things. We know that they enter the atmosphere in lethal amounts, but they're stopped long before it reaches the surface of the Earth. The air is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen with traces of other gases in them. If the air pressure or the ratio of those gases that make up the air were altered, we know life could not exist. It is not a great assumption to believe this balance could have evolved at the perfect mixture needed to develop and sustain life on Earth. Perhaps the single greatest evidence supporting creation is the human body. The more we learn about its complexities, the greater our faith in God of creation. And I will tell you, you talk to anyone that is in the medical profession and the amount of studying they have to do to truly understand the workings of the human body. And we have many people in here that have been in the medical community and are and understand this thoroughly, that you cannot be in that and understand perfection as Christ created the human body. Anything that gets off kilter, and we know that from all of us going to the doctor, anything that gets off kilter can really take a life. There's so many things that so quickly could take life away from us. And people, unfortunately, many even in our church have experienced this, whether it's disease, whether it's decay, whether it's unhealthy living, unhealthy eating, lack of exercise, whatever it may be, things can truly take a body down. And the perfection of God's monitoring every process going in our body from the tiniest atom through our cells through everything that goes on in the human body is just, it, it blows your mind. And the, the crazy thing is, is we think we know the human body. We do not know the human body. There is so much more that is learned each and every day. Science is always trying to understand the complexity of the human body. Many of us have just recently experienced this with reading about all these vaccines that are coming out to kill this COVID virus and just the complexity. I, I was very interested. My son and my sister both and my brother-in-law are all doctors. And, of course, they bombard me with everything that's coming through the medical news. So I get more than I want to know, and it's very detailed. But I was interested in the vaccines, and I downloaded a 35-page PDF document on all the vaccines and all the stages that they've been through in their trials, the ones that are coming out, the ones that have already come out, the pluses, the minuses, and all the things that they had to put into those vaccines to try to perfect killing this virus and stopping it from spreading. And it just boggles the human mind, the amount of details and intricacies that these scientists had to come up with to figure out a way to combat something that enters the human body because our bodies are so complex. And um, I, I tell you, you can't just, you don't even have to be in the medical field, which I am not, to understand that this body is so perfected by God in the way that it was created. So 
It says perhaps the single greatest evidence supporting creation certainly is our human body. The more we learn about the complexities, our faith should grow stronger and stronger in the case of creation. Consider how a tiny sperm and an ovum will not only produce a fetus that can grow to over six feet tall, but that specimen exhibits physical and emotional characteristics of the father and the mother. Evolution offers no reasonable explanation for this reproduction. Consider the complexity of the eye. Darwin, the originator of the theory of evolution, was baffled when it came to explaining the complexity of the human eye. The thought of the eye and how it could possibly be produced by natural selection makes me ill. That was Charles Darwin. Consider the delicate balance needed for blood to clot or not to clot, depending on the situation. How does the blood know what it is to do at the right time so that we can sustain life? And what about the brain and its amazing abilities? The adult human brain is 1.3 kilograms, about three pound mass of a pinkish gray jelly-like tissue made up of approximately 100 billion nerve cells or neurons. Its function includes voluntary motor output, sensory input from all five senses, speech and vision centers, memory, coordination, elaboration of higher thought and emotions. Just the thought of that should be amazing. It should show you that a creator had to create a brain that was capable of all those things in the form that it created your brain. Can you imagine a jellied mass with all that in there to sustain life so that we can think, so that we can live? So there's so much overwhelming evidence for the God of our creation that we should be fully, fully aware and believe that God is who he says he is. And he did what he said he did from the start of creation. And amen to that. I am glad for that as well. All of these symptoms make up the most beautiful machine imaginable. Imaginable. Nothing is useless. No space is wasted. All of this runs through a perfect rhythm and each system needing and relying on the other systems for its survival. Now picture the Michigan State University Library here with its thousands and thousands of books. Each cell of the human body will represent a single letter of the alphabet. Start with a random letter from A to Z, and now add a random letter every minute. Keep adding a new random letter every minute until you have a total number of letters that equals a book. What are the odds that these billions of letters will form perfect words? They'll be arranged to make a readable sentence, paragraph, chapter, and book. And now apply this to all the books in the library. Does that just boggle your mind? It, it, it's just something unfathomable for many of us we can't even imagine. Another shutdown to evolution is the concept of irreducible complex, complexity. If you remove one gear of a watch, the entire watch will not work. All the parts are needed. This is the same for animals. If the lungs are removed, the animal will die. Again, all organs need each other, along with mobility for the creature to be able to feed itself, sight to see the food, and on and on and on. 
How could have all these structures that are needed for the creature to live have evolved by chance concurrently? Greg Cadlib, professor of biomedical engineering from Lansing Community College, made that statement. The question proposed by Professor Cadlib was a valid one. In order to accept evolution, we must believe in a process that would allow billions of cells to evolve at just the right time and in a perfect sequence. Evolution isn't true. It isn't even logical. Before I close out here, I wanted to show you, I am so utterly amazed about creation. I had the opportunity to go to the Creation Museum. Believe it or not, there is one, and it's in Kentucky. Some of you may have been there. It's in Petersburg, Kentucky. It is an outreach of a program called Answers in Genesis. It is a biblical-based outreach, and it goes through every possible scenario of how man has tried to contradict things in the Bible. It is unbelievable. I could have stayed there for days, but unfortunately only had an afternoon there. But I didn't want to leave there without materials. You all know, if you know me, I'm a big reader. So I picked up these 19 little pocket books. <laughs> They're small books that answer questions on all these subjects. It is amazing. It talks about science and creation and evolution. This one is called A Pocket Guide to Six days. How long were the days? Because people debated it and said, oh, when God created the earth in six days, a day was not a day like today. A day was like, could have been a million years because the earth's been around for billions of years. So they debated all these things that God said in the Bible. And they have the answers in here. They give you lots of great ways to have conversations with people who might want to debate you on the subject, yet you're not smart enough to answer those on your own. So you have some reading material. This one is called Six Days, or Six Literal Days Necessary. Did Jesus say he created in six days? Could God really have created everything in six days? He answers all these questions. Here's one on best evidences, and it talks about evidences, best proof of creation. Does astronomy confirm a young universe? Is it science or is it the Bible? And how old does the earth look? Because there's a lot of debate about the age of the earth and billions of years come into play. Well, you have answers here to that. Here's one on ape men. Where, where did man come from? Was he from an ape? And it talks all about the, uh, probably things you've heard in the community outside of the church about the ape being the way man was formed and how we evolved. And it talked about similar features between humans and chimps and the DNA. And it goes into the detail on that so that you have some real foundational answers. Here's a pocket guide to Charles Darwin, everything that he believed, and then how he finally came to not being able to answer the questions that he himself thought he had answers to. The young earth, how old is the earth? Astronomy. Here's one on Noah's Ark, which I found that really fascinating. So I went 65 miles down the road to the Ark Encounter. Some of you have been there. I see heads nodding. It is a phenomenal day. I, I probably kept the people who were with me a lot longer time than they wanted to spend. They figured it'd be a two-hour trip through the ark, and I was taking pictures of every sign on the wall. I was taking pictures of all the creatures. <laughs> I just had a blast there, but I loved it because it answered questions for me. I had questions. How did they get the dinosaurs, these gigantic dinosaurs on the ark? Simple answer. They took the young because the young could reproduce. Why would they take the ancient dinosaurs on the ark? There's no room for them, right? So you go through there and you just learn so much about the different creatures and what happened and why did some of them go away? And it talks about the flood in great detail. So I just found that phenomenal. And if you have an opportunity to go there, you should go to the ark encounter. It's in Williams, Williamstown, Kentucky. But it's an incredible way to spend the day. I know our kids from the church went there, and they had an opportunity to stop, stop by and, and see everything. But it is phenomenal. When you get next to that ark, you will understand there is a God. 
because there's no human man that could have created that structure so perfectly to sustain what it had to sustain. So if there's even a slice of doubt in your mind anywhere, you can get answers to these things. God provided these ministries so that we could be well prepared to talk to others about it. And you can see, I get so excited about this, but there, there's a book on the human body and it goes in great detail about the human body and how God created it. There's one on dinosaurs, global warming, the global flood, you name it, they had books on it. And I swooped them all up. I said, I've got to have these because I want to know more. So if you need to borrow them, come see me. If you'd like to buy them, you're welcome to pick up the book and figure out how you can get them. But I know they do sell them. They sell them online, I'm sure. But Answers in Genesis is the place that it starts because it starts from the Bible and it starts in Genesis. So I hope that I've given you enough information today to think about things that maybe you've pondered or wondered about, and hopefully we had some answers. There is so much more to study on this topic, and I'm very passionate about it. But if you have questions, feel free to contact us. If you need more information, please contact us as well. And with that said, let me close us in prayer so we transition into our service. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity and this time to share the truth about creation We're so amazed. Our minds can't even comprehend, Lord, the wisdom it took to create every single thing we see, even our own selves, Lord. We're just grateful that you loved us so, that you created us so that we could be in communion with you forever and ever. Lord, I pray that people listening who do not have a relationship with God will raise their hand or come forward or contact us and say, I want to know more about God. I want to believe. I want to understand all these things so I also can be in eternity with you all in heaven in a place of perfect joy and peace. Lord, we ask you to be with each and every person. We ask you to be with Pastor Ryan as he delivers our message this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful, glorious Sabbath and the ability to worship you together. In your name we pray. Amen.